Okay. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Um, so I have the honor of standing on the Mariam Curie stage. Um, so I'm sure you guys are aware, but Mariam Mirzakhani and uh, Marie Curie were two of the famous um, scientists and mathematicians who made such a big impact in the world. They also happen to be women. So, you know, super proud that I'm standing here. Um, I have a nine-year-old daughter, and she's into math and science. And being the parent of a daughter, I'm acutely aware of some of the biases, uh, the unconscious biases, that sometimes prevent uh, women from achieving their potential in math and science. So I know that she'd be super proud of me standing up on the Mariam Curie stage. So H2O, thanks for that. I didn't ask for it, you know, but thanks. Thanks a lot for that. On that note, um, in the morning sessions, we had a lot of keynote speakers. Didn't see a single woman out here. So something that you guys should probably fix in the next time around. So anyway. Yes. Yes, you have a panel. Yes, you do. Thank you. Um, so, um, so guys, I'm going to be talking about helping data scientists uh, escape the seduction of the sandbox, right? Um, there's lots of great things for data scientists to do. There's lots of algorithms, lots of tools. But you know, unless you get all of this out into the real world, it doesn't count. It doesn't matter. Uh, I'm a data scientist myself. I love numbers. But I really like numbers with dollar signs in front of them. So this is really going to be about how do you get to those numbers with dollar signs, then simply numbers. So that's really what I'm going to be talking about. OK, so a little bit about myself. Uh, I love working with companies, uh, trans transforming companies, adding value, using the power of information. Uh, I would say I'm not a data scientist, but a data scientist. What I mean by that is I love working with data, but I also like to think of myself as a scientist, um, which is running lots of experiments. I love running experiments that generate data. Uh, that's one of my favorite things to do. Um, and also, I think all the other things that make scientists great, which is having that integrity, being able to publish good answers and bad answers. You know, there's nothing uh, which is you know, a successfully c completed experiment is what is helpful here. It's not about whether it produced the results that you intended to produce or not. OK, so that's something that I really care about. Um, if I were to retire at this moment, I'd do something interesting about around classical music appreciation. I'm a big fan of classical music, both the Western as well as Indian classical music. However, I see that people who take interest in classical music have some formal training in music themselves most of them at least. And I think that's so much of a gap because there's so many more people who do not have that formal training and could be really good appreciators of classical music. And so I'd find a way to do something around classical music appreciation. And maybe I'd find a way to scale it using uh, technology and, and data science. So that's probably what I'd do. OK, so why do data scientists love the sandbox, right? Uh, the data is always clean. Uh, you have access to the best toys, the best tools. The models always look great. OK, so what's not to like about it? Uh, in fact, if H2O were to produce uh, a product for the sandbox, they'd probably call it like pure water or distilled water or something, right? So uh, data scientists love the sandbox. However, the business value of data scientists in a sandbox is like negative dollar, right? You pay a lot of money to hire data scientists. You put them in a sandbox. And they run a lot of nice experiments, and they don't produce anything. So how do you get that from negative value to positive value? And how do you get data scientists out of the sandbox into, and into the real world? What's going to be effective for data scientists to be able to make that impact? So that's really what I'm going to be talking about. So what did we do at Wells Fargo? <laughs> we first started out by building, really, a world-class machine learning platform. So build you know, enterprise grade data provisioning points, <coughs> created a model training area where uh, we worked a lot with Spark. H2O is one of our key products there, helps us build these really powerful models in <coughs> extremely short periods of time. We have then a model scoring area where these models get promoted and run, and then interfaced with consuming applications. So we made a lot of investments putting this platform together and really leaving no excuse for data scientists to do their work either in the sandbox or on their laptops. <clears throat> OK, neither of that is going to be particularly helpful. So one of the first things that we did was actually build out this great platform. 
Next, we obsessed about operationalizing the models. <coughs> so um, I'd gone to another conference. This was, you, I, you know, you know the conference. It's a company with a big red logo, right? So there was a session there about uh, how do you operationalize data science solutions. And somebody stood up and said, oh, we use Docker, OK? But my point is, you know, Docker may be a technical solution, but you know, it's an incomplete solution. What do we need, really, about, to think about when we operationalize models? We need to think about three things. Business and people integration. We need to think about systems integration. And ultimately, we need to think about code and data integration. So these are the three things that you need to think about as you start to take models, really, really good models that have been built with really high quality data, and expose them into the real world. So what is business integration about? It's really about solving the right problem in an effective and a sustainable way. The way we've gone about doing this uh, at, at Wells Fargo is by setting up a centralized artificial intelligence team, okay, of which you know, I'm a you know, key member of from a data science perspective. And what the team does is work very closely with the business and identify the problems that have a strategic priority. Right, it's really important to work on things that the business really cares about. Uh, if data scientists work on problems that they care about but are 20th in the priority of the business, nothing is ever going to happen to it. Okay, so it's really important that you, know, you work on things that the business finds valuable. They may not be the sexiest of ideas, but it's going to have traction, and that's going to be more valuable than you know, a great idea that doesn't go anywhere. We oftentimes work to see the problem through the lens of the decision maker. The role of data science and the role of analytics in general, I would say, is to connect data to decision making. Okay, so it's a bridge between data and great decisions. And so we work really hard to sit down with the actual decision makers and see the problem through their lens and see how we can make a difference to the, to the decisions they're trying to make. Really important to get to that business integration. And then, throughout the model development lifecycle, working very closely and engaging really closely with the business SMEs, uh, working, you know, setting up bi-weekly meetings, really connecting with them, talking to them about the progress, and getting them excited about the solutions that are being built. Again, too many times I've seen uh, data scientists go away into, you know, like a conference room, <coughs> spend three months or four months building a model, and the business by the time has lost interest and moved on, right? So really important to continue engaging the business uh, with the solutions that you're building. Next stage is systems, systems integration, which really is about identifying and solving for the technology dependencies. Um, to be able to do this, uh, data scientists need to have early conversations with architecture and ensure alignment. Right? Any data science solution that you build, as you look to operationalize it, almost invariably is going to have some element of data management. Okay? So you cannot get to that solution getting operationalized unless you work with other components of the technology ecosystem and figure out how that solution integrates. Right? So, so that's going to be really important. Um, we, on our platform, have designed for three different kinds of model deployment. And I'll get to that in more detail. But it's really to try and cover the generic forms in which uh, data science solutions get deployed. So like I said earlier, it's really important to integrate with the data flows uh, within the company. Um, a company has, obviously, every enterprise that you work with is going to have a large number of business applications. Business applications are basically kind of software that really do something. Okay, so they are connected with operational data flows. What has happened historically is that a lot of the information or the data from these uh, applications have been put into analytic data marts. <clears throat> and these data marts is what you use for training your model. Once your model is trained, though, the, mo the model needs to be integrated back into those operational flows. And that is what makes this entire exercise challenging, as well as, I think, you know, very rewarding when you get it right. Okay, so it's really important to integrate your model with those operational flows. So what are the ways in which, like I said, you know, we, we've tried to do that at the bank? Um, we try to come up with three ways in which models are scored. Batch scored models, okay, where what you're working on is largely historical data. These are models for house price predictions, risk management models, targeting models for marketing campaigns, 
These are all examples of, of batch code models. Second, the model that is available as a service. Okay, so you make an API call from an application and you respond back uh, with a model prediction. These are uh, models that, again, rely on historical data and real-time data. Okay, so those are examples of uh, models that are deployed as a service. And finally, we've got, you've got embedded models, okay, where the predictions are basically reliant on real-time data. Example of this is a lot of the virtual assistants that, that you, know, you encounter in the world, which you know, rely on you know, what you're talking about and respond back to that. Okay? So these are the three generic types of deployment that uh, we've been working together with our technology partners at Wells Fargo uh, in order to be able to support a wide variety of use cases uh, when it comes to machine learning. Okay. Um, and then the final stage is code and data integration, which is really ensuring that the model intent that you come up with can be effectively translated into a solution that works in, uh, in the marketplace. Um, what are the different pieces that are going to be important there? Uh, first of all, um, code integration, it's really ensuring consistent tooling between model deployment and the, and the run development and the runtime environments. Um, it's happened to me so many times in the past. I've developed a model in Python, and the IT team wants to take that model and convert it into Java. Okay, they want to rewrite the entire model uh, because they don't run Python, uh, the data scientists don't know Java, and there's a disconnect. Okay, so it's really important to make sure that we have consistent tooling that allows uh, Python model uh, to be um, run in a Java-based environment, or have tools like H2O that allow Python models to be converted to Java models and run automatically. So that's great. Um, minimize handoffs between data science and technology. Anytime uh, when you build a model as data scientist, uh, anytime somebody else needs to take that model and rewrite the code, there are going to be errors. There are going to be delays, okay? You will not get what you started with, okay? So we try and find ways in which we minimize handoffs between uh, the data science team and, uh, and, and the tech team. And finally, the piece around data integration. Again, not in every case, but in almost every case, the data that you use to train your model and the data that you use to score your model is going to be different. Okay, in that case, you know, as people are familiar with, with the New York survey, mind the gap, right? So what is the gap that I'm talking about? Um, to be able to solve for this, you know, think about a model prediction. A model prediction will use historical data, near real-time data, and real-time data. So that's typically what a really good model is, is going to be about. In your model training sample, you'll, you'll have all of this available. It's historical data. It's stored away somewhere. When you try and score the model, you'll run into this thing called a data gap. Okay? What I mean by that is that the real-time data and the near real-time data is either not available, or it comes with a delay, or it comes in a different format, things of that sort. So that is a big part of what you need to deal with as you try to operationalize these models. There's no silver bullet to solve these problems. Okay, GPUs are not going to help you here. Neural nets are not going to help you here. This is hard work trying and understanding and matching data sources and making them work together. Okay, so I cannot you know, I just cannot underline enough how important this is and how many projects fail because people do not account for this thing called a data gap, okay, between the models, the data you use to train your models and the data you, you need to, you use, you have to score your models. Okay, and finally, it's, it's critical to get all of this um, um, in the right structure. So again, you know, many of you might have seen this, what a traditional data scientist is, is really somebody who combines domain knowledge, software engineering skills, and math and stats knowledge, right? So that's what a data scientist is really about. Many of you in this room probably understand your domains really well. You are PhDs in areas like math and stats, and you're really good at software engineering, okay, which is what makes a lot of you data scientists. But we look for a few additional things. Um, we certainly look for process discipline, the ability to follow a consistent process when it comes to training the model so that when changes need to be made and when um, you know, somebody else comes onto the project, 
they're able to pick up and run with the model just as efficiently as what you know, the person who built the model would have. So in one of our projects very recently, um, while operationalizing the model, we discovered that a couple of the data sources that we used in the model were not available in the runtime environment. We had to retrain the model with all those two data sources. And guess what? We managed to do it in two hours, okay, though we were working with billions of rows of data. The reason why it worked was, um, obviously, I think we had uh, extremely good support in terms of software from tools like H2O, but we also had the process discipline to lay things out in such a way that it was super easy to kind of flip out those two variables, run through the whole cycle again, do a five-fold model training, and have a validated result at the end of it, all in the space of two hours, okay? And we were working with transactional data, a year's worth of transactional data, okay? So the amount of data that we were dealing with was not, was not minor in terms of what we're doing. Um, really important for data scientists to have skepticism. You know, you cannot assume that everything that you do is going to be right. So you got to be skeptical of results that you, of, of, you, of the work that you do and be able to kind of question your own results as well as results that you see from other sides, right? So that skepticism is really important. And the final piece for me, I think, is tenacity, right? So um, it's really important for data science to kind of uh, stick with the problem, deal with some of the challenges that will come with some of the data inconsistencies, and really still be able to solve that business problem. Sometimes take a couple of steps back and step away from, you know, to kind of borrow what Agu said, uh, step away from the perfect model and work with a model that's really good, but solves the problem that you're trying to solve way more effectively. Okay, so that's really what we look for. So when I'm looking for data scientists, I don't look, I mean, obviously I look for the technical skills, but in addition to that, these are some of the intangibles uh, that we try and recruit for. So finally, just to recap, what are some of the things that you need to get data scientists out of the sandbox? One, number one thing, build that top-down strategic alignment, right? Make sure that the, the conversations about the application of machine learning and artificial intelligence are happening at the highest levels of your company and you've got that top-down strategic alignment for what you're trying to do. Number two, obsess about operationalization, okay? Uh, work really hard to make sure that the solutions that you build actually go somewhere, okay? And finally, last but not the least, hire and organize great talent. Uh, none of this really works unless you have uh, the great talent uh, to make machine learning models possible. Um, I, you know, I'll go back to what uh, again, um, uh, Shri said at the start about Endaro Mahanubhavalu, okay, which means, you know, welcome all the great minds who've come here. So you need great minds and people who've got that deep understanding uh, for people to be successful, and that's where that great talent is going to be so important. So um, thanks a lot. Um, if your company is doing these three things, uh, great, right? If they're not, we are hiring. So please come and work with us. Uh, you know, so uh, um, we're doing, we're taking on a number of positions, both on the data science and the technology side, uh, doing really exciting things. It fires me up every morning uh, to come and work at the bank and work on these artificial intelligence, machine learning type problems. Um, and uh, again, I'm glad I got the chance from H2O to come and speak in front of you guys. Thank you. <laughs>